Our next speaker is Professor Michael Snyder. He is the Chair of Genetics and Director of Genomics and Personalized Medicine at Stanford. Welcome, Michael, and thank you for flying in and landing just in time to get here. Okay, well, thanks. It's really great to be here, and it sounds like it's an amazing meeting from what I've heard so far, and I look forward to seeing a little bit this afternoon myself. So uh, I'm going to start with this premise that I think probably this crowd will certainly believe already, which is I think the way we do medicine these days is entirely wrong. Let's see. So it tends to be very focused on illness. As such, it's very reactive. We measure very few things. Uh, the frequency when you're healthy is usually quite rare, usually every few years. And most medical decisions are population-based. That is to say what's based on data that comes from the population, they make a decision about you. I think most of us would agree we should be focused on keeping people healthy, as such be very proactive. We're certainly capable of measuring many, many more things than we currently do. And I would argue the frequency should depend on what you're actually at most risk for, and that could actually be discerned in several different ways. And I think we would all agree it should be individual based. And I think this then leads to this theme, which is a big one in the medical school these days, which is to be focused on precision health. So to illustrate this point, I actually like to put up this slide. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but we're told since day zero that our oral temperature is 98.6. And that actually, first of all, turns out to be wrong. That was done with an instrument that was too high in the calibration. So actually, the median number, and this is a very typical study. You'll see others like it. It's actually 97.5. Not only that, the 25th quartile is here, 94.6, 75th is there, 99.1. So that means if you actually have, a, say, a baseline at this 25th quartile, 94.6, you go to the doctor, she takes your temperature and it's 98.6, she'll say everything's fine, what are you doing here, go home, it's ridiculous. But you're actually up four degrees Fahrenheit, which of course is not probably a healthy state to be in if that's your baseline. So the point is that we actually really need to know people's individual baseline and then find deltas from that. That's a big theme for our lab. So we're very keen on trying to bring all kinds of data into trying to understand people's health, what it means to be healthy, and then catch people's transition to disease at its earliest possible stages. And so with that, we actually, you'll see in a minute, we sequence genomes, we actually follow people's exercise and food and things with the wearables, which will be the theme of this talk. Uh, but we also measure environmental exposures and other things as well. We try and measure many data types to try and see what impacts people's health on an individual level and then actually catch disease at its earliest times. So starting about now nine years ago, come March, we set up something we call personal omics profiling, where the idea is in addition to sequencing people's genome, we measure many other ohms as well, most out of blood and bodily fluids, uh, like urine and things. Um, but uh, yeah, and in its most deluxe form, we actually measure 14 different ohms, if you will. But routinely, I'd say about seven or eight ohms for most of the studies we're doing. We literally collect billions of measurements. And then about six years ago, we added on biosensors, and that's what I'll tell you about today. And these folks are actually very deeply clinically analyzed, um, but there's a lot of the cohort, so 107 people we're following, a lot of the cohort actually is pre-diabetic or diabetic. Uh, well, nine of them are diabetic initially. Uh, many are pre-diabetic. Um, and so we're actually very interested in following glucose control, like or oral glucose tolerance tests, insulin resistance, and things like that. And so we've been sampling people basically quarterly, in my case for nine years, uh, for most of the cohorts about six years, some are new recent additions. There's even a few people in this room who I know are actually part of the study there. So. Okay, so I'm not gonna get into this much detail, but by actually following people in incredible detail, we've now come up with 49 clinically actionable health discovery, not counting hypertension, which is pretty rampant if you count that, it's actually 67 health discoveries. And there are all sorts of things, I won't get into this, but we caught one person with early lymphoma, two with pre-cancer, something called MGUS and smoldering myeloma, sick people with plaque in their arteries. Um, yeah, about 12 of these are genetic tests. This person had a mutation. Young person actually turns out has a heart defect, which we figured out from his genome first. And so by bringing this different data types together, we could really understand people's health and then actually catch some early signs of disease. 
And as I say, I won't get through all this. It's really a lot of fun, but I'm going to focus on the sensors. Okay, so probably many of you appreciate there are now over 900 sensors. There are even websites getting set up for this. I know there's one at Scripps that has a list of all these so you can go see. And they measure all kinds of different things. So we, about, I guess, six years ago now, we, we got about 30 of these devices, tested them out. Actually, getting the data was the hard part. Um, and then basically settled on eight or nine of these. I guess I use nine of these things every day. In fact, I'm wearing three smartwatches right now. Uh, this ring is not really a ring, it's really a sensor. This one's a motif uh, and other sensors you'll hear about in a moment, including... So they, they measure all kinds of things, though, like radiation even measurements. They can... Actually, there's some interesting buildings around here that up a little bit. Um, anyway, uh, but they measure your activity, heart rate, skin temperature, sleep, all kinds of different things you can measure with these sensors. And so I'm going to tell you about how we've been applying this to actually learn things about people and their health. So as you might appreciate, what's special about these is they make continuous measurements all the time. And so you can follow people's patterns. So this is my circadian pattern. So starting in midnight, back to midnight. Uh, this is sleep, heart rate, skin temperature. So I sleep at night, wake during the day, occasional nap, back to sleep at night. Heart rate, low at night, high during the day, back down low at night. Skin temperature, which is different from oral temperature, high um, at night for most people, then drops and comes back up, and so on and so forth. You can follow people's patterns, again, through their days, weekends, um, a little bit different from weekdays, so on and so forth. And so you get people's baseline measurements. Those are mine. Here's 43 other people. We've now done this for probably over 100 people. Everybody, there's no surprise, everybody has a different resting heart rate, different skin temperature, different blood oxygen, and so on and so forth. So then the fun part is to say, can we see people when they deviate from their baseline and what sorts of things might you see? So for me, one of the most prominent things we discovered, which is known already in the literature, is that your blood oxygen drops on airline flights. Okay? So this is me flying from San Francisco to San Diego. That's altitude in green. Plane goes up, comes down. That's blood oxygen. Starts here, drops to, <clears throat> it's not usually that consistent, but this one was, and comes back up. Okay, and this is and usually a little bit higher than that. And that's me. Here's 17 other people. We've now done this for about 30 or 40 people. Take that back. Actually, more like 60 or 70 people uh, that we've measured. And everybody, with only one exception, drops their blood oxygen on airline flights. So what you won't find in the literature is how low does it go and how long does it stay low. Well, it turns out, for me, it goes a 90 or below about 5% of the time on flights. And it also turns out that you know, most flights are typically around 92, 93, although I've been flying a lot lately, so I've actually come up a little bit. I've adapted. Um, and it actually turns out that, um, well, I'll come to that a little later. All right. So what you also won't find in the literature is what does it mean to you biologically? And it turns out it correlates with fatigue. So here is just a blinded test of t saying either uh, tired is blue, alert in red, and for me, that threshold's around 96% uh, oxygenated hemoglobin. So when my blood oxygen's at 96 or below, I'm typically tired and 96 above. And that's true whether I'm in the plane or on the ground. You can also do reaction time tests. And the bottom line is you're faster when your blood oxygen is higher and slower when it's lower. So we think the reason you're tired on airplanes isn't because you've been working too hard or partying too much or what have you. It's really that they drop the air pressure in the plane and you get tired. Your blood oxygen drops and you get tired. Okay? So if you're a workaholic, that's extremely disappointing because you can go in all charged up, right? And you'll still get knocked out when they drop the blood oxygen. Well, it turns out you can adapt on this. And for me, that number is seven hours. So for a long flight, after seven hours, I'll actually come up to normal. I won't show you that, but that's kind of cool. So if you've really got work to do and you're on a really long flight, hang in there. You may actually get it done at the back end of the flight. All right, <laughs> there you go. So the other thing uh, that we discovered is that actually this can be a sensor, if you will, for illness. Okay, and I was able to figure out my Lyme disease, in fact, from these wearables, the combination of smartwatch, uh, sorry, smartwatch and blood oxygen. So uh, the backstory on this was I was helping my brother put up fences in rural Massachusetts where 55% of ticks are Lyme infested. Um, and then two weeks later, I was flying to Norway through Frankfurt. So on the short flight from Frankfurt to Norway, uh, 
basically, this is what my blood oxygen did. This is what it normally does on a, on a short, kind of low altitude flight like that. It drops down typically about 96, 95. For this one, the median was 90. And when I landed, it never came back up. It stayed low. Um, furthermore, we uh, was watching my heart rate. It actually went up as well. This is low resolution, but so it was up high on the flight and high thereafter. Uh, and I later learned my skin temperature was off as well. So in fact, actually, all these things were off. I then got a low-grade fever, went to a physician in Norway, who I warned him it might be Lyme disease because of the timing. Uh, he drew bl blood and said, yep, your monocytes are up. You have bacterial infection. And he recommended penicillin. I said, no, I need doxycycline, which is what you use for Lyme. Which you might imagine was tense for a few moments there. He was not very appreciative. Um, anyway, he, he did give in, but it was very reluctant. Um, Anyway, uh, I did take it, and then when I got back, I gave blood again and tested, sure enough, I was lying positive. And because I measure myself all the time, uh, I'd actually given blood before I'd left, and in fact, it was negative. It's a very well-controlled experiment. So I'd sear converted during that time. And so the point out of all this is that my, from pulse ox and from heart rate, we could actually figure out early signs of getting ill. So that prompted us to go back and look at I'd been wearing the watch for two days, or two years up to that point, and had 73 times when I'd given blood and measured CRP, which is an indicator of illness. And it turns out there were four periods of high CRP. One was the Lyme period, and the other two are, are confirmed viral infections. The other I didn't report being sick, but it turns out I had very high CRP, same as illness measurements. And what you'll see is every one of these days where I was ill, I have high outlying heart rate, sorry, this got a little shifted, and skin temperature. So every single time I got ill, you get high heart rate and high, high resting heart rate and skin temperature. So that prompted us to write an algorithm that actually lets you find deviation from resting heart rate as when basically in half hour windows, we use sliding windows. And with that, we actually think we can tell when people are getting sick before they're symptomatic. It might be at times when they're first feeling a little bit ill, but generally it's, it's, it's before they're actually certainly would call it being very ill. And it's a little complicated, but it's basically a, a delta plot here where change from resting heart rate. And so every one of these, that's when the blood was given at the red line. Uh, and where you first pick this up, you can actually see this. this is true for me. We had three other people who got ill who were wearing these devices. One of them got sick twice and same thing. Every single time with a very high signal to noise, you can tell when people are getting sick because their heart rate goes up. And the skin temperature doesn't work as well because I think people aren't wearing the watch tight enough to pick that up so well. But the heart rate one works very, very well. So we're now rolling this out to do this on 1,000 people. So if you want to join this study, especially if you get ill a lot, we would love to have you. Uh, and you can sign up, and we would try and tell when you're getting sick before you know it. OK. The other kind of devices we've been using is actually glucose monitors. So you may appreciate there are several now of these devices on the market. I'm wearing two of them right now, Dexcoms. Uh, and we've been using these because a lot of our folks, as I say, are pre-diabetic or diabetic. I'm actually type 2 diabetic myself right now. Uh, and basically, we put these on both those folks as well as on lots of normal people. And then what we did look, saw was we have people who are basically following different patterns. So here are folks who have pretty good glucose control, very little spiking. These are moderate spikers. And these are actually severe spikers. And it turns out there's lots of normal people, I'll show you in a minute, who are spiking just as much as diabetics, actually. So in fact, 9 out of 10 pre-diabetics have no idea they're pre-diabetic. So a lot of you, I guarantee, are spiking your glucose probably right now because you just ate lunch. Uh, especially if you ate a lot of carbs, you're probably spiking into not so great ranges. So we set up algorithms for being able to systematically analyze these patterns. And we use something called spectral clustering, again, to systematically look at these patterns and start classifying the different peaks into you know, low, medium, and severe in a simplistic fashion. And so each row is a different person here. And this is the fraction of time they'll spend in low, moderate. So these people are, are spiking much. These are moderate spikers. And these are pretty severe spikers. Uh, I can tell you we put people on different foods. And it turns out people will spike to different foods differently. That is to say, some people will spike to protein bars, and others to bread and bread and peanut butter. It depends. Aaron Siegel has had similar observations, at least some of this, but not all of it. It's actually, only a minority fraction. Some of this is due to your microbiome. One thing I can tell you is that 80% of people 
spike the cornflakes and milk. So that's like poison for you, actually. So <laughs> if your kids are eating this stuff, everybody spikes. It's not really, quite frankly, very good for you. All right. So as I said before, we can then, because we put these on all kinds of people, people who assumed they were healthy, pre-diabetics, et cetera, we can start classifying people. And over here, it's just grouping people by whether they're severe spikers. This is looking at sort of glucose patterns and clinical data. And so the red are severe spikers, green, moderate, blue, not so much. And over here, we've color-coded them by whether diabetic, pre-diabetic, or non-diabetic. And here's two examples of people who are severe spikers, are spiking just as much as diabetics, who actually were normal by fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1C, or oral glucose tolerance tests. So we think that this, uh, um, these devices, actually, because they're measuring you in your natural eating environment, are very, very powerful for capturing what's going on. The last sort of sensor I'll tell you about is actually environmental sensor. So one area that I felt we were never measuring very well on a personal level is actually your exposure, your exposome. So we actually set out to measure airborne biotics, so biologicals you're exposed to, like pollen, things like that, as well as abiotics, like um, chemicals such as carcinogens, pollutants, et cetera. And this, uh, these are important for asthma and allergies, as are chemicals. These are important for cancer and health. So basically what we did was you took a personal air monitor, we re-engineered it so it has a pump in it, sucks up air, and basically it pulls air onto a filter, a submicron filter that captures lots of particulates. And underneath that we have a chemical absorbent so it captures all the chemicals. And basically we, we basically use this device, one during the week, one during the weekend, one each trip. It was actually my Florida device. I just flew back from Florida. So we'll measure the different locations. And so we'll sample these uh, over time. And for the particulates, what we'll do is we'll actually harvest all the DNA and RNA from them and sequence very, very deeply to see as many organisms as we can. And for the chemicals, we actually elude off the chemicals and then run mass spectrometry with a pretty sophisticated instrument to see as many chemicals and other organs we can, uh, um, other uh, molecules we can follow. Okay, so we've done this actually for three people we followed quite some time. I've actually been using this device now for five and a half years. Uh, but we have two years of data, that's me. There's another person who wore it for a year, another person for three months, and then we have some very targeted experiments I'll tell you about. Now, I travel all over the world, the green person's me, so we get samples from all over the place so we can see what they look like. Okay. Uh, the other people travel somewhat too, and everybody, of course, is, lives in the Bay Area, so lots of Bay Area samples. All right, so what do we learn? Well, first of all, the exposome is vast. We're gonna go through the biologicals first. We've seen over 2,500 species. Each sample has about 300, whoops, okay? Uh, and so there's a lot of biologicals that you're breathing in every day. The exposome is also very dynamic. So this is following me over time. That's the second person, that's the third. And basically this brown color here is actually fungal exposures. Uh, green, of course, is plants. Red is um, bacteria. Uh, blue are actually animal um, exposures you can measure as well. Uh, and the bottom line is this is, putting it by time, this is clustering by panel patterns. And so there are plant days, there are bacterial days, there are fungal days, and so on. So you can actually see what kinds of exposures you get. And same is true for others as well. What we wanted to do is quantify how much the exposure comes from what. And it turns out location is probably the number one driver for what we can assign. A lot of it's probably actually personal location, which is hard to assign. But we can show uh, globally that um, yeah, location is probably the number one factor. So these are all my samples here. And basically all the red ones, if you will, this is separating them out by, if you will, the patterns, uh, something called clustering here um, of the sort. Uh, and anyway, the red ones are my Asia samples. They tend to be over there. Uh, let's see, we have other ones, uh, Europe and others there, clusters in slightly different patterns. And then the second most uh, uh, dominating factor is actually seasons. So your season is a pretty strong influence on your exposures. So we actually looked at this in a lot of detail when we've done many analyses, but I'll tell you one fun experiment that I think many of you might appreciate. We put these devices on four people the exact same month that took four samples, four or five samples from the folks who were wearing them. So one was me and I travel a lot. So now I'm the red circles here now scattered about. Here's a person who commutes across the bay. Here's a person who works and lives in San Francisco, and here's someone who works and lives in, in Sunnyvale. 
So each of us wore these devices for a, for a month. And basically what we found was that everybody has a different exposure pattern, even people who live relatively close to each other. So the Sunnyvale person's pretty different from me, only one sample similar. Uh, and then this person's different, and this person's different as well. So everybody's quite different, okay? You can actually see what organs, organisms are driving this. And so for the San Francisco sample, some of the most prominent um, organ, organisms that were here, but not in other samples, is this one here, which is a bacteria found in sludge. And if you've ever been to Market Street, you realize this makes a lot of sense, okay? Can occasionally pick up pathogens as well. So you can actually see what kinds of exposures are showing up. So I have you know, my personal home exposure, which is a little different from the Sunnyvale exposure, and so on and so forth. For seasonal patterns, there are hundreds of species that show seasonal patterns. And so in green are the ones that are peaking in spring, spring. These are summer, these are fall, and these are winter. So you can get lots of different things. So actually, here's a, a case of this is pine, which peaks late spring, early summer. Uh, I always thought I was allergic to pine. I have mild allergies. That actually turns out it correlates better with eucalyptus. So in fact, if I take down a tree in my backyard, the pine's going to stay, and the eucalyptus is going to go. Okay, This is a, 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 a kind of a fungus called false turkey tail that actually peaks late fall and so on. So most of these weren't, or aren't described in the literature, so these particular ones are. Occasionally we can find pathogens, so, uh, but they are very rare in the samples and they show up in some samples more than others, like the New Orleans samples seem to have its share of uh, opportunistic pathogens. Uh, but they, again, are very low and I doubt that these are causing any issues unless you're immunocompromised. For chemicals, there's actually tons of chemicals, about 3,000 chemicals we pick up. Um, this is actually one interesting correlation that we had. Some of them are seasonal. Uh, this is a case of actually um, where you can actually tell um, when it's raining, if you will. I don't know if you know, but when you can smell when it rains because the pressure drops. And basically, this chemical, geosmin, I guess is how you say it, actually comes out of the ground. That's how you smell it's going to rain. That chemical comes up and you smell it. It turns out, um, there, I forgot to say, but there are plastics in every sample. There's actually this DEET that you spray to keep insects off. That's in every sample. A couple of carcinogens, D diethylene glycol, is actually in every sample. Um, but its amounts will differ from one location to the next. So it turns out when it rains, this plastic one goes into the ground. This earthy smell comes out, so those body scent comes off you. And actually, this pesticide comes out of the ground, too. That's in every sample, too, actually. Although, again, more in samples like the Davis sample, things like that, than others. One of the most interesting correlations we have is this one here. We correlated biologicals with chemicals to see what would correlate, what might anti-correlate. And what we discovered is that wherever this nasty chemical is found, this is a chemical most commonly used in paint, but in other areas as well. Wherever this is found, it anti-correlates with fungus. So when you have this pyridine around, you don't have a fungal exposure. So my house was painted by a green guy. There's no pyridine in sight, and I have a fungal exposure at home. So this could either be good for you or bad for you, of course. If you aren't allergic, then you probably want your fungal exposure. But of course, if you're allergic to black molds, maybe you want this around. Of course, you'll probably die of cancer, but that's a different <laughs> story, I suppose. So anyway, the point out of all this is that you can at least measure your own exposures and make your own decisions, so to speak. So the bottom line is we all have our personal exposome clouds that we can measure. And this is a mine, if you will. So it's comprised of a lot of things associated with humans, like your skin bacteria and things are all coming off into these devices. And then there are plant exposures and other things. I have a cat, dog, and a guinea pig at home. We pick up all those. And if you think about it, we actually have half the reads I didn't tell you are human reads, so you could actually tell who you're exposed to, too, if you had people's personal genome sequences. That's a whole separate discussion, I'm sure. All right, so where is all this going? Well, we think that not only the omics information, but the wearables, and I'm sure you're hearing this already throughout the meeting, but we think all this will actually go into your smartphone. And so we've been building a dashboard to actually house and display these sorts of data. So we think this will be at least an important tool, if not your doctor, in the future. And you'll minimally be able to share this information, of course, with your doctor. And so in the long run, I envision a world where we'll be combining wearable information along with omics and genome sequencing to better manage people's health. So uh, I'm going to wrap up, save a little time for questions, but I've been very fortunate to have some amazing students and postdocs work on this project over the years. Uh, so this is just a few of them, when you shall, 
Brian Piney, Kevin Contrepois, Tejas, uh, others are leading the omics part. Wearables is led by Shao Li, Jesse Dunn, Dennis Allens. Glucose exposure, I guess I didn't put up here, but Heather Hall, Dahlia Perman. Uh, we have a great clinical collaborator with Tracy McLaughlin, and our microbiome work is done with George Weinstock, and the exposome work is done by Chow, Shin, Laura, Ting, and uh, Sean. So I think I saved time for questions if you guys have any. Thanks again for having me. Yeah. So you have shown that the world is very rich, right? The but world is very rich. Yeah. Very, very rich. Yeah. But of course, it also goes hand in hand with a very large, uh, in fact, uh, exponentially growing number of false positives. Right? If I have a billion variables, you know, the number of false positives would be enormous. So how do you, how do you supposed to deal with this, this dilemma? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess. I don't think what we're measuring in general is false positives. We usually confirm, like for the mass spectrometry, for the things we're sure about, we'll go run standards and be sure. So I think our measurements are all fine. If the question is false positive because something goes off in a particular time point, uh, that is what we look for. So the classic case would be the wearables, what we do for getting sick. You know, the reality is we're, well, we're going to put this out to people and measure delta from resting heart rate. So what will happen, people watching a scary movie will probably send a signal off, and I think you'll just have to use common sense. I was watching a scary movie. I'm probably not getting sick. Okay, we can't tell that from afar, although we can tell if people are walking and things, right, with other sorts of sensors. So in some cases, it, we will just have to use good judgment. In many of these cases, you will see something, like on, the, on those 49 health discoveries we had, um, we would find something that looks strange. For example, the transcriptome of one person said, there's something wrong with this person's liver because all these markers were off. Same with the metabolite profile. And then they did a whole variety of follow-up tests, and sure enough, there actually was uh, some liver issues. And they didn't really pass clinical significance until several months later. So we actually picked it up early because they're making so many measurements. Uh, and so in, in many sense, I guess I'm saying this, these are pointers to so other things you can follow up as well. That's yeah, a great question, though. Yep. So if you can, uh, oh, okay. Uh, Either way, we we'll get to both. The exposure map based on where you were in the world, you mm -hmm. know, can be exposed to different things. But the my immune system is also uh, dependent on where I have lived, where right. I grew up, and so just because I see enhanced exposure doesn't mean that I will actually see or get affected by it. Just my immune system is used to it and takes it in stride. Yeah. Is that, so there's a historical portion of things that. Yeah, so we are, yeah, we're total ecosystems in terms of how we operate. And, and our immune system, our, the food we eat, it's all in balance, but it can all obviously get out, out of balance. At some point, you will die of something. And the question is, yeah, well, you can try and control that uh, for a while anyway. We'll see if you can reverse it. But um, anyway, the point is that. You know, that people, some will die a lot earlier than others, and in some cases it's due to nasty things that they've been exposed to that they shouldn't be exposed to. Okay. You know, a lot of carcinogens are out there that probably shouldn't, people shouldn't be getting exposed to. And the other flip side of this I'll say is, I don't know if you follow the autism at all, but now we're up to one in 40 births are autis autistic kids, which is unbelievable. And it's not easily explained by uh, simply better diagnosis. Something seems to be going on. And we, nobody knows what that is, actually. So that's a classic case of why you'd like to have these sorts of measurements. So I, I think we need these. Uh, and you're right, a lot of this will be balanced. And, with, and you may have a certain immunome or epigenome that's perfectly balanced for your exposures. But there are probably areas where that could be improved, I would guess. Yeah, I'm not sure. You were next, actually. And then we'll go. Mm -hmm. how, how important is the accuracy of the device? Oh, uh, so first of all, they don't have to be that accurate because you're always measuring your delta if you're trying to see deviations. So in fact, the blood oxygen monitor, we were using two at the time, I discovered this, but one of them um, was terrible. Actually, it's probably off by a factor of two. Um, it would be measuring, but it would always be reproducible. 
in the sense that, so even though it was off in absolute values, it could tell the difference between, you know, when I was up in a plane and on the ground. So it was good enough to actually tell these differences, and actually the, the Lyme disease was picked up both with that device and with the better one. I'm glad I had the better one, because nobody would have believed it for the other one. Yeah, that's correct in this case from personal baselines, yeah. But it makes it hard, obviously, to compare across people if you don't have good accurate devices. But these days, I can tell you, the heart rate stuff is all super accurate. It's much, much better than you're going to get in a clinical office, doctor's visit. We've done that experiment. It's very clear that this is better than what you'll get in a physician's office by a lot. Yeah, we'll go front to back then. So yeah. uh, okay, is there back any benefit then. to using regulatory established thresholds for toxins? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think um, probably most do. And a lot of these things, like DEET, there, there are numbers given for what you put on your skin, but I don't think there are any numbers for what you breathe. So there are these kinds of issues that are out there, and I don't think they're fully resolved. It's a great question, though. And by the way, even normal clinical numbers aren't always useful, actually, for standard clinical measurements. But, yeah. I saw a lot of use on uh, principle component analysis. Uh, can you talk towards other methods or maybe the methodology used for analysis in general and differences in, in <laughs> Yeah, it depends on which study we're talking about here. Maybe we should take that offline, but it's, it's um, typically we'll take all the molecules and there are these various similarity scores you can use for things. For dynamic things, we like to use, um, well, C means clustering. I can tell she's standing up. Probably wants me to get off. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, do I have time for one more or boot, or boot me off? One more quickie. Okay. Who's got a quick one? You have yours quick? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm just curious about your, <laughs> micro, about your microbiome work. Yeah. How far along do you think we are in getting actionable information? Out That's of a great question. Two of the folks who became diabetic in our study lost diversity in their microbiome, so that's probably one of the first times you could really show correlation of diversity as a clinical value, actually. So that would be one avenue. I think it'll be most important, though, in things like IBD and ulcerative colitis, areas like that, where you could probably catch those conditions faster with a microbiome measurement than anything else. A so very interesting story from Larry Smar on those two. You might look that up. Okay, thanks again for having me. I'm wearing eight. Cool. He's wearing eight devices right now. Yes.